Hello, everyone. I just wanted to share with you a really sweet podcast that I had the great privilege of being on. It's called He Said Ea Dijo with Rosalind Sanchez and Eric Winter, and they are such a sweet couple. They're both very well-known actors. They have a really sweet dynamic together. We talked about family and that dynamic and mom and dad guilt and healing and trauma and how trauma influences our success in many ways. And, uh, and what is enough? Is enough ever enough? It was a great conversation. And he said, hey, Adio is a part of the iHeartRadio My Cultura Podcast Network, dedicated to celebrating and elevating Latinx voices, stories, and creators in English, Spanish, and Spanglish. My episode is already out, so please make sure to listen in. And you can find He Said Ea Dijo wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Hello and welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And uh, this is a very exciting day for Jamie and I, Liz. Oh. Uh, for Jamie... We're about to have his childhood best friend on the show, Aww. Alyssa Milano. Mm. You were best friends with Alyssa Milano? We were inseparable all the time. We hung out so much. Aww. We worked together um, and was introduced to her um, as I was producing her music because she was such a big, huge child star. And what they oftentimes would do at that time would do a, an album because she could sing as well. Her family's, you know, really well versed in music. So we started working and then, you know, uh, we became super deep, dear friends and we're inseparable for mm. many, many years. Mm. And uh, for me, it's exciting. Uh, I, I recently did Alyssa's podcast, but what you might not know is that I uh, got my SAG card, which basically is the, the, the card that allows you to work as an actor in the union when I was, I think it was 19 years old mm. as a background extra. <gasps> on Charmed. Oh my gosh. And I worked for three days. <laughs> I was completely objectified in some strange demon outfit showing my body. And I a handed her outfit. a tray of grapes. Wow, we that interact. took three days? Basically. <laughs> uh, I was just Well, the rest of it, I was just standing in the background okay, like, got it. looking like a demon. Um, like, you know, not like with demon makeup on, but I was, a, I guess I was in the, the underworld, if you will, on Charmed. Got it. And uh, we didn't interact. I handed her a tray of grapes and then I left. How many times did you have to, to hand the the tray of grape, grapes? Uh, How, how I many I probably takes? handed that tray <laughs> 10 to 12 times. Got it. And every time, I was very excited. I absolutely had a crush on Alyssa Milano. Yeah. As, um, many most, people did most, back then. Most young men did. And here we are now mm. getting to talk about uh, all these amazing things. Mm. So it's super sweet. Good. Let's do it. Let's get into it. All right. We'll be right back. This is Man Enough. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. No joke. Now I started taking AG1 because in the hustle of daily life, I struggled to get the proper nutrition I need, and I wanted to improve my overall health and my energy, and Athletic Greens made it so easy and delicious. And you know what? Since I started taking it every morning, right when I wake up, it's actually something I look forward to. I can feel the difference when I'm giving my body what it needs to thrive. So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you are absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and your aging. Now, as someone who's getting older, that is speaking to me. And it contains less than one gram of added sugar with no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, while keeping it tasting good. Now, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it's completely lifestyle-friendly. Tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high-quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a bunch of different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash man enough. Again, that is athleticgreens.com 
slash man enough to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hello and welcome back to Man Enough, Jamie. Jamie Heath. Yes, sir. Are you excited about this? Oh guest my that we gosh! Have today? Yes, this is my childhood <laughs> friend. This is my girl right there. Like <laughs> Who's on family. the show? We got Alyssa yeah. Milano right there. Woo! We got. Um... Oh, you're my only friend from high school. <laughs> the only one. <laughs> The only one. Alyssa, let me just tell you something. I've Jamie has been one of my best friends for over a decade now. I know your friendship lasts tw- three times as long. But he, I've never seen him look so boyish. He looks a little boyish right now. Like, you're blushing a little bit. You, you're <laughs> like, you're, blushing. Like, I just go back to being like when we were, you know, kids running around and dancing in the clubs and hanging out in New York and getting arrested and or you know, at least pulled over and, oh. <laughs> and her brand you new. Got, you got arrested? No, we didn't get arrested. Well, we just we just had a moment where she brought she listen, got this. My first experience with systemic racism was with Jamie when he was driving my brand new Mercedes and the cops and he was like, I was like, you can drive. He's like, Nope, I don't think I should drive this Mercedes. <laughs> and this was along to thirty three years ago. Hmm. And did we get pulled over? I don't oh, remember yeah. if yeah. we did or, yeah, we got mm-hmm. pulled over because Jamie was driving my Mercedes. And what did the cops say? Like, what what, what was, happened? What reason did they give you? <clears throat> well, I addressed it at that point. I was really, really um, stupid the way that I dealt with police officers then than I would now. I was fearless. So I had told Alyssa the way, basically we were, we had been driving and we pulled over, we were parked. We weren't even moving at that time. And the mm-hmm. cop car went by us. And I said to Alyssa, oh, wait, give it about 10 seconds. That car is going to turn around. Oh my she gosh. was like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, he's about to turn around. So right on cue, he makes a Yui, comes up behind us. And I'm like, ah, OK. So I dealt with it in a way that was um, where I get out of the car and I go and I immediately address the police officer. Yeah. Oh, I, um, I remember this is all coming back to me now. So he comes up behind, comes up behind and then his, before his lights even come on, I go and knock on the window. And I addressed him. I was like, so I know why you're stopping because you see a nigga in a Mercedes Benz and you can understand mm-hmm. it. So um, is that what's going on? He was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, you just drove by. You looked me in the eye. You turned back around. And then he started, well, so whose car is it? And then oh, that's when they came over. And Alyssa was like, it's my car. What do you? Then they ended yep, up back. 33 years ago. Um, and that affected her much because she was like, what the hell just happened? And it happened to someone she cared about, of course. So I think from that point on is when you... Um, it's not that you didn't care before, but you saw it firsthand. And, yeah. um, and then she championed things. Yeah, I saw, it, so. I saw it firsthand and I was horrified. And mm. I've been continually horrified for the last 33 years because in that respect, nothing has changed. Mm. You know, it was interesting. To, uh, what was it? Six months ago, I got a random FaceTime from you. And the phone was on his dash. And... Mm-hmm he was talking to a police officer in the car with his wife and he just wanted to make sure there was somebody else yeah, there. Yeah, the, the, the pullover it. was fine. Nothing happened. The police officer was 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 just fine. Um, it was a little squirrely, but I recorded um, just because my instinct, of course, is like, I just need somebody witnessing me being pulled over. And, and, he's uh, li- and, he, and I was like, how yeah, is this, how is this my best friend's reality? Hmm. That impacted me for sure. There are certain like monumental things that have happened in my life that made me, you know, the the activist woman that I am today, you mm-hmm. know, and that was definitely that was definitely one of them. Mm-hmm. And I just got in that car. So I must have been 16 at that point. Probably 16 or some. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It must have been like right when you got your life starring on Who's the Boss. <laughs> so, well, with all this, we haven't really like officially introduced you because um um, we're just all familiar with one another. So let's just do this. Let's introduce and welcome Alyssa Milano. Let's read a little bit about you. You're an actress. You're an activist. You've been in the spotlight for most, if not all of your life. You have been involved in the advancement of Tarana Burks' uh, hashtag Me Too that sparked a viral movement of women fighting against sexual harassment and assault. You've been involved in Time's Up since its inception. You have remained politically active and have recently published a book, Sorry Not Sorry, which um, please everyone should get a copy of that's inspired by your podcast with the same name. And you continually use your voice and platform to advocate for social justice, fairness, and equality, which I can vouch for has always been something that you've cared about. 
And um, mm. your voice has gotten louder in different arenas and things of that nature, but your core and your parents, um, who they are, who are like family for me, Lynn and Tom, just um, adore them, are also about that. And um, so it's in your bloodline, I know. Um, so welcome to the podcast and, you know, being willing to Yay, talk thank about you. all this stuff with us. Your podcast is all fancy. You're yeah. fancy. Any... Look at you. <laughs> look, at, look at my. This is this is my this is my podcast sign. But it's not as cool as what it looks like on the camera. Thank you, though. You know what? We're learning to accept compliments. Yeah, there we go. Thank all right, you. let's do that. Thanks. There you go. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Receive Alyssa. It. Receive um, it. We like to start things out with like a real question. Um, so Justin normally asks, but Justin, allow me to ask this. Hey, it's um, all yours, baby. <laughs> Face, tell us a time. In your life, uh, when you did when you did not feel enough. Oh, my entire my entire life. I think for anyone who is uh, was an you know a child prodigy, which is you know I started working when I was seven. I think that there are elements of my entire adulthood that I've felt like I've need needed to prove that I wasn't still the little girl that people, and, and mind you, I think that was self projection. Like, I think I was projecting my own insecurities onto people, but I felt like I always had to overcompensate or prove that I, I was okay. And I was going to be stronger and, and I was going to continue to work past, you know, 18, which most kids on sitcoms at that time, they didn't. Mm. Um, and so I think I took that all the way into my 30s and 40s. Mm. Mm. Um, I think I feel more than enough now because of my, my kids and because I realized at a certain point that 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 trying to expand people's idea of who I was um, was in, disabling me from doing so many other things um, that I also knew were important and that I would feel fulfilled with. Mm. So I, I think, yeah, I think forever. Well, I know what that's like. Yeah. I mean, as you were, as you were talking, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's me too. Mm -hmm. Overcompensating, overcompensating, overcompensating. I mean, that was my entire childhood and high, like high school life, mm. college. And then, what were you? What were you overcompensating for? Um, I always, I, I write about in in my book this idea of um, the things that hurt me the most were when people said I was full of myself, because the reality was that I was empty of myself. And it was that mm. emptiness that was causing me to compensate and like put on this, like try to be a man, this masculine thing, this, you know, I feel like I put every mask of masculinity on that you could ever try on over the course of <laughs> 20 something years. And none of them made me happy. Uh, I think compensating for wanting to be valued and liked. I've recently come to the conclusion that my entire career is a trauma response. I just want to be valued. I just want to, I just want to have value in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means now that I know about it, that can be an, there can be a enough. There can be an end. I can be like, oh, that's that's enough. Versus like chasing the carrot forever mm -hmm. and ever and ever until I fall into the mm -hmm. to the grave. So I don't know. I don't know that that ever. I don't know that there is ever enough in our industry. Well, there isn't. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that comes mm -hmm. from us, right? I think that that's what's so difficult about it. Have you ever had that conversation? It was this was a conversation I had with Emily. As we're talking about this and we're talking about the systems in our industry and the entertainment industry for anyone uh, who's asking or curious, but this idea that there is never enough because we're all in the business, I think, sure, we have lofty ideals and some of, we want to make a difference in the world and have impact, but there's also, we have to acknowledge the parts of us that are trying to heal. Yeah. So my wife at one point asked me, well, when is enough? And I had no answer. So like, well, okay, well, what is enough money? What is enough success? What is enough, you you know, how many, you know, how many, you want to, do you need to direct a movie a year? Is that going to be enough? Mm. When are you going to, like, when is that ever, when does that end? And in our business, and I think in the culture we're living in, there is no end. It's like, mm. 
I mean, you you know, you look at there's men so who many were... things. There's so many things that that have come to mind while you're speaking. One of which is is um, we're made to. I mean, just society in society, we're made to feel like it's never enough, and also our reward system in the United States is all about more and more and more. We consume more, we buy more, we make more, we work harder mm -hmm. for less. And so I think all of that, all those social constructs um, are not a good combination in our industry. <laughs> and then the other thing that I, that I thought of is that I'm actually getting to the point where it is enough. Yeah. I've worked really, really hard my entire life. Um, but that's not why. I've also worked really, really hard at who I am, mm -hmm. at what I believe in. Uh, I've worked hard in self-reflection -ref and every type of therapy you can <laughs> possibly go into. And what started happening for me is that I am now so sure of who I am that to go and portray something else, portray another person to embody someone else and embody their trauma. And in order to embody the character's trauma, you have to go into your own trauma. Well, guess what? I fought really hard to, to heal my trauma. I don't want to bring up my trauma anymore. Mm. I don't want to play someone else. I want to be me. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting it's getting close for me. And thank God it's it's happening in a in a in a um, in a in a, the, the control is in in my hands mm. because so many women in the industry, uh, you know, after forty, uh, start to get less and less work, and I think it it crushes them. And because the industry is their only fulfillment. Um, it is a really hard thing. And so, yes, I just got to this point recently where I'm like, you know, I'm going to do this to like when I need to make money, you know, if I want to do something in the house or or take a trip with the family, I'll, I'll do a project. But as far as playing a character and really dissecting the humanity of of a character I'm over it because I've fought I fought for way too long to figure out who I am. I have a lot of friends who feel that uh acting is cathartic. I don't. I feel like it's you're picking out a scab. Mm. Huh. You're listening to the Mad Enough podcast. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Factor. Hey everyone, it's Jamie Heath here from the Mad Enough podcast and I am back in action. Mindful, breathful action. And yet still, like we all do, I got so many things to do and to get done. And I just don't want to spend my time in line at the grocery store, hunched over the stove and all that stuff in the kitchen when I could be with my family, my wife, my kids, doing things that I love, like making music and reading a book or just watching one of my favorite TV shows. And now that I leave my meals to Factor, I don't have to meal plan or prep or any of that stuff. Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7 with fresh never frozen, prepared meals that are so delicious, you wouldn't believe that they were actually good for you. They deliver chef-crafted meals straight to my doorstep. They save me all kinds of time, not to mention the cleanup, the dishes, all that stuff that you normally have to do after cooking a meal. And each factor meal arrives pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes. I mean, that's faster than ordering in. Their registered dietitians and expert chefs work hand in hand to create meals with nutritious ingredients. And with more than 27 meal options each week, I'm never bored. They offer vegan and veggie meals, cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, plant-based bars, extra protein, veggie sides, and even more just to keep me fueled and focused all day long. And let me tell you, I indeed have been using Factor for a long time now, and I love it. I mean, I really do. I really love it. The whole family loves it. So head to go.factor75.com slash manenough120 and use code MANENOUGH120 to get $120 off. That's code MANENOUGH120 at go.factor75.com slash MANENOUGH120 
for $120 off. All right, welcome back to the Mad Enough podcast. So we are, one of the things we're trying to do, obviously on this podcast is to talk about um, manhood, like unpacking what that means in the world and to us individually mm -hmm. and some of the toxicity that's, in, that's included in the wonderment that is also manhood. Um, and as we're doing it, we have Liz here who has been holding um, us, I can speak to myself, me personally accountable um, in some of the way that I feel and how I walk through the world because I really care about this, but some things need to be adjusted and realigned and um, I can't do that alone. Um, so she has offered so much to us in that. And I know that you have really had a strong voice in the advancement of women's rights and um, protection of their body. And, um, and yet also I know that you've had um, a bunch of controversy also um, and how, and dealing with all of that, um, while trying to fight for things that you care about, I, you know, I'll, I'll go to bat for you till the day I die. Um, cause I know you, your intentions in your heart, um, in terms of some of the stuff that was surrounding me too, and credit and how it was attributed and your role in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, some of that. And I know that Liz, you know, have you have particular um, insight and, you know, observations well, on that as well? I, I know that as a, as a white woman in this space, I'm, I'm constantly uh, failing <laughs> at navigating, um, you know, taking up space to, you know, voice yeah. my opinions and, and, and try and have an, an impact, but then not steamroll or again, um, not give credit to the women, particularly women of color, marginalized women, non-binary people who have come before us, right? So, so I mean, I, I would love to know how you navigate that as 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 a white woman in, the, in this space too. Yeah, I mean, I think with me too, it was a, a unique situation <clears throat> because I was not aware of Toronto Burke's work um, when I sent out that initial tweet. And probably for three days after that, um, while it was, you know, going viral. And then as soon as I found out about Tirana, I had a really interesting reaction. I was fucking relieved <laughs> because I am not equipped to navigate a movement um, and she had been doing the work for so long and I felt like, oh, oh, thank God. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be okay. And all movements are messy, but you know, I mean, that's, that's the least of, of my controversy. You know, I, I have, I have been really vocal, um, on social media and have misstepped many times, but I think part of the patriarchy is expecting activists to be perfect mm. at all times. And maybe the criticism is a way to try to silence the, the effective activists. Mm. So to me, I look at it as, um, as a great responsibility to be able to, can I curse on here? Yes. To fuck up, you know, and fuck up publicly and then be able to um, to make amends and fuck up better the next time. Mm -hmm. It's not really about navigating. You, you cannot do this work with ego first. Just doesn't work. So in the moments of, look, and Jamie can tell you, people have been trying to cancel me since the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that just is, is a non-existent Thing to try to to silence me um but my thing is like what what a gift to be able to publicly misstep correct the misstep with grace and have other people not only see the redirection but also see that it is okay to misstep mm. it happens to everyone mm -hmm. Um, we're in a time where we need to, social media is sort of cloudy, clouded all of this, but the call out culture, I believe can be really harmful for people. Um, I've somehow, you know, and my therapist and I talk about it all the time, like 
maybe I'm a sociopath because it doesn't it doesn't pierce my my being. Hmm. Like, yeah, it hurts. It'll hurt more from um, activists on on our side rather than the other side. But, um, you know, hmm. those who are fighting to keep oppression alive and well versus those who are trying to dismantle and eliminating all forms of hierarchy. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's just part of it, you know, and I really appreciate when people call me in instead of calling me out. Can you talk a little bit about the difference, Alyssa? Yeah. So calling someone out is putting them on blast. And the interesting thing about calling people out is it lights up your reward center in your brain. Mm -hmm. So people feel really good about doing it. The person who actually calls out, it lights up that reward. And which, and for That's anybody listening, correct. the reward center of your brain is the part of your brain um, that controls dopamine. Serotonin, dopamine, serotonin yeah, the response. Serotonin, yeah, serotonin, dopamine response. And I mean, that's a real thing. And it mirrors the same brain response as actually doing humanitarian work or or doing doing good. So... So because part of social media is so much about that reward center, that's why we like the likes. Mm -hmm. It's why we like when people comment. It's why we like the retweets. So when someone's calling someone out publicly on a platform, mm -hmm. like I've been called out many of times on Twitter, it is actually be, your brain thinks that it's doing the, the right thing. It's not impactful, as we have seen. You can't just cancel someone. <laughs> uh, what are we going to put everybody on an island who's canceled? Like that doesn't make sense. Um, so, so yeah. So calling in is, for instance, um, when when I know you guys don't like to get political, and I'm going to try really hard not to get political because no well <laughs> only speak, only two of us no, no, only no, no, two no, of no, us here speak your truth. don't get political. Yeah, yeah, yeah no no um but yeah so when joe biden announced and tara reed came forward with allegations of misconduct um i felt very strongly after doing my own research and uh and uh you know collected the the evidence from people that i truly trust that that story wasn't being told in truth. And I said that publicly. And calling in is getting a phone call from Tirana saying, you know what, I don't know if you should publicly do that because it sort of dismantles the whole idea of believing women. And I was like, you know what, great, you're right. I'm gonna write an op-ed to talk about how I handled that wrong. So people learn hmm. that the call in culture is much more impactful than the call out culture. Hmm. And so, uh, and I write about it in my book in Sorry Not Sorry and how that performance of calling someone out and then being rewarded for that performance, I think is a very unhealthy way to grow as a society. I don't look at it as controversy at all. I look at it all as opportunity. Can you tell us about your relationship with Toronto Burke and what you've learned from her uh, and, and informing yes. your own activism? She's magic. So Me Too went viral. And suddenly, you know, and the first time I spoke to her on the phone was like three or four days after it went viral. And I, and I made her a promise. I said, any opportunity I have to talk about Me Too, I will, of course, include you and hand over the mic. So then it became this very... Like this sisterhood that was so pure because we were both wide-eyed at what was happening. Like she certainly didn't plan it on it happening. Mm. I, I've sent lots of tweets. I never created a movement. So the two of us were like, what is happening? And I was starting to get this when I was recognized in, in, in person. And this, these moments were really, really beautiful. But I, I would have women come, come over to me and grab my hands. This was before COVID, obviously. <laughs> and look into my eyes with tears in my eyes. 
in, in their eyes. And they would say, me too, which then would bring tears to my eyes. And I would say, me too. And I was living like mm. this festering open wound because guess what? I thought I had dealt with my sexual trauma. I had not, I had stuffed it away. And so now all of this was bringing it all to the surface. Mm. And somehow I get this miraculous phone call from Toronto. And I would say this is like a week later at this point after it, it goes viral. She goes, hey, sis, just wanted to call and see how you're doing. And that is Tarana Burke. Hmm. She is so much of, like, first of all, for her to even know that I was hurting, hmm. you know, was big. But then to to go out of her way to recognize, you know what? This person is also a victim. And I... I can honestly say that that my that what happened just from growing in her light was that I went from being a victim to a survivor. And that's where the power in Toronto Burke is. Mm. You have to be a saint to dedicate your life to hearing about stories of sexual assault, abuse, harassment, misconduct. That is her entire world. And it's not about this fame. She's actually very uncomfortable with the fame, maybe a little bit more comfortable now, but in the beginning, she was incredibly uncomfortable with the, with the fame. And so, yeah, and how it has informed my, my, uh, my own activism is, you know, I think I'm a lot more aware of the the way in which movements can be super, super messy and the way in which it is really important to have someone with a real clear idea of where we're going. Mm. Um, and th that's who she is for me. She is that she is that that person. She, mm. uh, I could, I could, we could go six months without seeing each other or talking to each other, and then we're wide eyed when we see each other. Like, can you believe this? Mm. Mm. So um, I love her very much. Tell, tell us about. Thanks for sharing that. Your you've been open about um, some of your struggles and some of the things in your life that I think has been important for people to hear. Um, one is um, obviously your own abuse stuff that's happened to you, um, mm -hmm. which has allowed, you know, in fact, what's interesting is you and I have never had a personal talk about um, the abuse that both of us have experienced. You know, I have a whole mm -hmm. um, um, life change in my direction because of dealing with it, you know, head on and now being able to say it out loud and admit it, not to hand behind the shame of it and all of this. And you um, have given many of people to um, the opportunity to express it themselves. Um, also, you talk about postpartum um, with a lot of bravery. My wife um, experienced it for a good portion, and I didn't recognize her, and I probably didn't show up. No, I didn't show up. I tried to show up the best I could, but it, but um, that just feeds me. I didn't show up for her in the way that she needed, and um, which only spiraled it more, you know. And that, and here we, I, here I. I am saying that I believe in the elevation of women and one of the very things that happens to so many women, um, I didn't acknowledge fully. Um, so your work in that and what you talk about, tell us tell us why and what you're learning and, and why you do it so much. Well, listen, my first dipping my toe into activism um, was when I was 15 years old. Uh, I met Ryan White who I don't know if you all remember him, but he was um, the first child to publicly uh, say I am HIV positive from a blood blood transfusion. And this was a you know during that time when there was a lot of stigma attached to HIV and AIDS. 
And he and I became friends and he asked me if I would go on the Donahue show with him to kiss him to prove that you cannot get HIV AIDS from casual contact. And I did. And that's when I realized why I was given this gift of fame and Mm. success. And I realized this is what I needed to do with it. I was 15. And the thing about that experience that I really took away from it is his open openness, his heart, his openness, and his ability to be vulnerable very publicly chipped away at the stigma surrounding HIV and AIDS. And there are moments in my the trajectory of, of, of my activism where um, it has all been about erasing stigma. And so, I mean, that my mental health issues, um, which really came to the surface after the birth of my, my beautiful boy, Milo, uh, who's an amazing drummer, by the way, Jeannie. <laughs> like an amazing drummer. Uh, I've seen some videos that you sent. It's so good. But yeah, so I needed to live with with my own truth there and, and erase the stigma stigma and not only for, you know, activism also helps the people and also helps advocates. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and not only because it's fulfilling and it, it, it makes your soul feel good, but also, you know, you're, you're working on yourself at the same time. So I had a very hard time after my son was born. I um, had very little support. Um, I'm sure my husband felt much like you felt, Jamie, of of that uh, helplessness feeling and not recognizing uh, the person that he fell in love with. And I, because of the lack of support, by the way, I was shooting mistresses at the time. So I was working 70 hour work weeks, had a newborn, uh, breastfeeding, pumping on the set. I was a mess. Um, but I was, uh, the way in which the only way in which I felt like I was getting support was to go to the emergency room. And so I spent, I don't know, a couple of days a a week in the ER getting pumped with, with benzos and trying to break the siege of this insane postpartum anxiety that I had. And I eventually wound up asking to go be institutionalized. And so I 5150 would myself. Wow. And it was there. I spent three days there. My baby was a baby. Nobody understood what was going on. My mother was, you know, you know, my mom, the most loving person in the world. She's like, I don't understand. You need to buck up, you know, because people don't know how to help. And um, <clears throat> through that experience of being in the hospital, I um, I found the psychiatrist that would help me still to this day. Um, uh, and and so and I feel really blessed. I believe that everyone should have access to all healthcare, but even more important than all healthcare is mental health care. Um, I think. Mental health is as important as going to get x-rays on your teeth to make sure you have no cavities, to go get your ears and your nose checked and your blood pressure and, you know, do a stress test for your heart or a colonoscopy. I want to erase the stigma of mental health. I think it is ridiculous that people can say to me as a way to try to troll me or insult me, did you forget to take your medication today? Mm-hmm. Words like, that's crazy. You're crazy. We use these these terms as insults or derogatory terms. And and um, we, we need to change that because uh, there are so many people on this planet that need mental health care that are not getting it. 
and don't even it's not available a lot in the art country and i'm fully aware that of that there's like actually a shortage of psychiatrists and therapists um but beyond that the world globally excuse me must be the truth we need to work on uh erasing the stigma of mental health agreed yeah mm. my mom is um one that I, I um, would love to see that for who is, you know, bipolar and all the stuff I've had to deal with, with her. Not even, no, not the stuff I've had to deal with her, all the stuff she's had to deal with. And, um, and as a result of the stigma being there and affecting me and, um, and how I treat her, how I see her, mm. um, I do use some of these terms that are yeah, did you? Productive. It's hard to break yeah. those habits. Yeah. You know, it's hard to break. It's hard to, to um, redefine language to coincide with everything we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about parenthood. Yeah. So you have a boy, Milo. Mm -hmm. how, how are you raising your son? as this feminist activist and and i'm asking more to learn you know i have my, my boy's going to be four soon by the time this comes out he is four um i'm just curious uh how how you're raising your son specifically knowing all the things you know about the world the power dynamic the patriarchy you know the the sexual assault numbers your own experience mental health i'm just curious what are you instilling in him and how are you doing it for any of us that are that are I have boys out there. Um, a, a few things. One, one is, uh, I don't know if you should be taking parenting advice from me, <laughs> but I will say this. My husband and I work very, very hard at parenting because I believe that you get out of it what you put into it. Um, having said that, I have a boy and a girl, so I get these these gender studies all the I was time. Ask about my, the girl next. Yeah. In my home, like there is, you know, and my son is very, uh, like I always say, if this gives you any indication of what my kids are like, that my son is probably going to wind up joining the Peace Corps and my daughter is probably going to get arrested at protests. Like they're so, they care about everything so much, but the way in which they use that as an outlet. Yeah. Is so, so, so very different. It's hard with boys because we so badly want him to, to be able to talk about his feelings, to be able to relate to his sister in a way that is, um, has nothing to do with, with gender um, or whatever their sexuality winds up being. Um, we talk a lot about feelings, but I'm also really conscious of that. Like he's an athlete, so he's on a soccer team and a baseball team and a hockey team. And, and, you know, a lot of the world hasn't caught up to this, to this way of, of raising their children. So I'm also very conscious of, you know, the, the coach that, that'll scream like, you're running like a girl. You know that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced uh, that yet with him? Have you heard yeah, that? I, I have Ooh. on his soccer team many years ago. And what did you do? I want to know what Alyssa Milano did when she heard. I went over to the father. Yes, she did. Of course, I did. And I said, you know, I don't know. And he actually said, "You're running like a girl. What are you going to hit him with your purse?" Mm. This was a this was soccer. And by the way, at this time. Uh, let's see, he's 10. He was probably six at the time. So it was a bunch of six year olds oh playing. God. So I went over and I was like, hi, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I just have a lot of opinions about things and I'm really, really sorry. But I just want you to think about when you say things like that, what you're saying to not only your son, but all of these boys, but also my, my three year old daughter who's right here, who heard you say those things. And he was very apologetic. He was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And hopefully, yeah. you know, he's very nice about it, but hopefully he hasn't made that mistake again. But 
the level of the caliber of sports that my son is participating in, it's becoming more and more competitive. And it is, I don't want to do him a disservice by not allowing him to feel things like competition and 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 masculinity and all of that because i know that to be competitive in these in the things that he has advanced in mm. he's going to need it but we talk a lot about it mm. and we talk a lot about um just common equality and what that means and it is wonderful. And we do little things like, I don't know, I take them to go see women's basketball instead of men's basketball. Hmm. I make them watch a women's soccer game instead of a, a well, men's soccer game. Well, they are better. I mean, we, we, women are, are the American women are the, sure. the better yeah. soccer team, let's be honest. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but, you know, and I point out things like, my gosh, look at how they're celebrating together and lifting each other up. Yeah. Like, that is so beautiful or look at that pass they they pass three times instead of like hogging the ball and going to the net hmm. you know so so things like that and i will also say that both of my children have had feelings doctors that's what we call them um hmm. for the last three years hmm. who we check in with again because i want my children to feel like taking care of their mental health is as important as going to the dentist mm -hmm. and as as like yeah. normal yeah it's normal you have to go do this you have to go you know get your flu shot you have to talk to your feelings doctor and just check in and let them know how you're doing and my kids have such incredible tools that they are able to use for nervous tummies or feeling anxious or feeling sad mm. uh, you know that i did not have until uh, i might not still i still might not <laughs> yeah, honestly like they so yeah so that's we're trying to find the balance i think this will be a lot easier once i'm able to have conversations with him about sex about about oppression, mm. about what feminism means. Um, you know, right now that's a little, I try to teach based on things that come up that he can grasp. Mm. We're also teaching consent in my house. Great. It has nothing to do with sex. We're teaching consent in the way of, Milo, ask your sister if you could play with that toy. Bella, can I play with your toy? No. Sorry, Milo, no means no. Mm -hmm. No means no, she doesn't want you to touch it. And that's worked really well. Thank you. That's worked really well. Yeah. As far as like, you I've do. heard my daughter, I've heard my daughter say to people, like, you know, I don't have to do that with my body. Yeah, yeah. And you know, me healthcare is a privilege in this country and mental health uh, healthcare is a, even a bigger privilege. Like I, uh, my parents didn't have the money to uh, for me to have a psychologist growing up. It would have been tremendously helpful. So, what are you, you know, advocating for when it comes to to, to mental health care, so that everyone has access to that in this country, even people who have less privilege than you know all of us? Yeah. I mean, I think we got to get health care for everyone first, and I think that that has to include mental health care. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are more cops in schools than there are counselors. Um, and that's, that's not great. There are more policemen in schools than there are counselors. Yeah. Just think about that. I, um, I'm curious, Alyssa, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up the middle grade high school version of man enough right now. And it's been a challenge for me. So we basically adapted my book for adult men um, for 
10 to 16, 17 year old boys. Hmm. And um, one of the challenges was the sex chapter and the porn chapter and, um, and hmm. the consent. All of those things piled into this one big taboo subject. And, um, hmm. and I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback because I don't really hold back. I know there's going to be a lot of parents that are like, you know, maybe not happy that I'm being as forward as I am about it. But I was introduced to porn when I was 10. And the age right. is getting younger and younger and younger with the advent of technology and parents giving their children access to phones, specifically smartphones and iPhones, because all right. the other it's friends not, have. It's obviously not just porn that they're able to find on on the internet. I mean, I have a friend whose child found corpses. Oh, God. <sighs> on the internet. Yeah. So, so, yeah, the internet's a problem. And, um, yeah. Well, you just brought me back to... You just brought me back to being 14 and a friend, ugh, how about this? A friend invited me over, it was a new friend and him and his dad, oh my God, ugh, I feel this in my body. I haven't even thought about this. That's, him, that's him, called somatic, you're yeah. feeling it somatically. Oh yeah, and I'm doing a lot of somatic work right now. So I'm actually very, I'm very, in, very in tune with, with all of that. But I actually uh, just met Peter Levine. I've had two sessions with him. He's the pioneer of somatic experiencing. Very Amazing. interesting. Amazing. Yeah. I will. Yeah. We'll text about. We'll talk after about our what we're doing. I'm doing a lot of deep, deep somatic work right now. Um, but I, so he, he invited me over for him and his dad to watch. They were watching this thing called. I think it was called. Wow. Of course, I remember because it was so traumatic. Faces of Death. Oh yeah. I, had, I remember that. And there was like a whole, it was a VHS tape and it was like all things dying. It was like real people being killed and shot. And, and I was like, what the, what are you, what is this? It was the most, one of the most traumatic things I think I've ever seen. I think that's also why I'm processing in real time. Why I, um, I have a really hard time watching anything that has to do with somebody being shot or because I, I was far too young and they were like it was like they were watching they were like eating popcorn that's also every action movie like it's literally seeing people being blown up too right like meaning not to minimize what you went through yeah. it, it but it's also Normalized. sort of mainstream culture for it to be for children to be exposed to this sure. from an early um, age video games yeah. yeah yeah and i and i you know i was not a, ever a big gamer but i just remember this being mm. you know horrible horrible but back to the sex conversation so how do you think we do that? How do you, how do you think we start to have those conversations? And, and I am curious. At what point do you think you are going to come forward with them about your own um, traumatic experiences? Um, and I, or if you are, oh, I definitely will. I think there's a lot of things that have to come first with those conversations, though. Mm. Like first, the, like the 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 sex conversation. Like they they go to this this very small school. It's got a full barn, their school. It's very um, progressive. And the principal of the school is this incredible gay man. And he has a round table with the kids. I just thought that this was so interesting. A round table with the kids in fifth grade, my son's not there yet, where he talks about uh, his husband and how, you know, he realized when he was just about the kid's age that he was attracted to, to, to men instead of girl, instead of girls. And so I think that our conversation will coincide with that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it takes a village yeah. We're we don't have to have all these answers ourselves and we should lean on those who actually mm. whom we trust, whom have gone to school for this stuff. <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. their their yeah. principal went to school about like when it is age appropriate to to teach these things. Um I I was not ready to learn of intimacy or sex or anything when I learned of it because I was I was abused as a child. Mm. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you. 
Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, making sure that that doesn't happen to the kids is like the first priority. The first thing of like, if someone tells you not to tell, that's when you tell me. Uh, so it's those lessons. Don't let anyone, you know, touch you in your privates except for Dr. Bromberg, uh, mom and dad, right? Like it, it becomes those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I, I, I believe that to tell these things without the history of the subjugation of women is, and maybe that's where you go for your book, because listen, I mean, I think, I think you're all incredible feminists. And I think Justin, you're making feminism cool and digestible for other men. And, you know, we can sit up here and talk about what feminist means. And to me, it means eliminating all forms of a hierarchy, right? And then you, the thing that you have to remember um, is that the oppression of women or, or the inequality that women face is literally the oldest form of human subjugation. And so what I, what I try to instill in my kids is equal humanity, right? Human beings all striving for and being given the opportunity for equal humanity, mm. right? So, you know, and when you're able to say these types of things and have the kids get it, like, I don't know, feminist studies started when there was absolutely no books on feminist studies because nobody thought to actually study women and feminism and the oppression of women. And I mean, you're doing the right thing, but it's tricky because feminism or, or being man enough requires a total reconstruction of society. <laughs> no big deal. It's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And it's just what we're all trying to do. You've, you've just found a way to say it um, to, to which is very, um, digestible. To well, men. I'm only speaking to men. And I, I, I so appreciate you saying that I will have to say and push back a little bit that most men, I don't think it, it, it I'm making it cool. I, I wish I could, I'm trying to figure out what that barrier still is with us men. And every one of these conversations is helpful. And I'm like learning and well, learning and learning. I, mean, I, you know, I wish it was way cooler. Um, and I wish it wasn't me. Uh, I wish it wasn't a, a man that had to do that. That's the other. Well, it's, it's the not. Other uh, well, let me just add this. You you are one of the people, right? It's not you. Uh, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not you. There's a lot of people in, in the world, different parts of the globe. That We've interviewed many of them. Yes, indeed. That are a part of it cool. and are making it yeah. cool as well. So um, Justin certainly is but one also, of them and, and he makes it digestible to a certain group of people and, and to many of us. So I appreciate that. Uh, let me just jump in real quick because I wanted to say something about this idea that when you're talking about raising your kids with these ideals, as I'm trying to, as you are, um, and not just our kids, but our neighborhoods and other kids and, you know, um, in the school systems, all community completely, but raising them with the ideals and with these things is not enough because there's a lot of people that I know that have good intentions that are raised with good parents, with good thoughts, and then don't know how to actually implement them that don't then, um, sacrifice their own comfort for these ideals that they were raised with, right? We, we, we want to raise our children and all of us men in school to number one, have their lenses on correctly so that they see humanity, the equality of men and women and all people, but also to know that when you go out in the world, there's so much smog out there that will constantly challenge the lens that we've raised you with or that you're being taught in school or whatever. So they're going to be, uh, always obscured and unless you're actively doing things to wipe the stuff away, then you end up becoming part of a problem as well without even knowing it. Um, so two it's things, hard. it's so hard. We have to raise it and then we have to actually do it like daily. What are we doing? What are our boys mm -hmm. doing? What is Milo doing when he's 15 now, 15, 20? Like what are you actively, not just believing in your heart, but where are you placing it? How are you with other friends? How are you developing your company? How is your, own club in your own home, like whatever it is, what are those things that we're doing? Um, has to be remembered because I forget and I care so much 
and I forget weekly, daily, um, in doing the work, you know. Sorry, well, Jay, I think you want to say something, or Alyssa, but, or Liz. No, I was just going to, de- I was just going to deflect. That, that was all I was going to do, so thank you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, something happened with Milo the other day where he came home and he was super upset, and I was, he didn't tell me why, and I finally got it out of him after, you know, snuggles in bed and watching weird slime videos. Um, I said, what's up, what's going on? You know, you can tell me anything what's happening. And he said, well, one of my friends that has been to my birthday party before made fun of me today because our house is so big. And I looked at him and I was like, you tell your friend that your mother has been working since she was seven years old. And this is the house that your mother bought and see, and see if that changes anything. And he was like, oh, you know, he felt less bad knowing that that I worked super, super hard for it, Mm. you know, and and, you know, but it's it's hard. But I do think like what would you say? Can I challenge you on that? What would you say to him if you found out that the person who said that was a young black girl? I would say the same thing. I've worked since I was seven years old um, and I, I was able to purchase this house. Um, the young black girl would, you know, be very, uh, we would have to probably teach him about, um, the inequities and the, uh, you know, the ways in which, uh, systemically we have not allowed for the same success, although the entertainment industry, Hmm. um, takes takes advantage of all kids. I mean, that opens up the opportunity for another great conversation, which is, you know, about systemic racism and, and how, and what he can do. There's a whole chapter in my book about, you know, conversations that I've had with them about, you know, George Floyd and, um, you know, my, my, my daughter saying, uh, uh, they still do that, Mama, because the problem is, is we teach so much about civil rights as if it happened so long ago that our kids can't wrap their heads around that it's happening right now. You know, we don't we teach about Martin Luther King Jr., but we don't teach about the injustices that are going on right now in schools. Right. And so I think that I would use that as a as an opportunity to um you know, speak to him to that. All of this, though, needs to be done with, you need to meet a child where they are. Yeah, sure. And I think this, I really do think these conversations get easier when you teach the history of oppression. You know, when you teach, I mean, when you think about the fact that women's inequality and oppression is so old that it, I don't know, it seems normal to us that is that there's no historical memory of a time when women were not oppressed by men. There is no country in the world who is that has ever achieved. Well, in, indigenous cultures were matriarchal, right? There, that's not. There, there is no, there is no uh, wealthy nation that has ever achieved equality through women. All right, colonial, yeah, colonial, you know, that's how we have to decolonize, right? So any country that was co- that was colonized, mm. colonized through patriarchy, white supremacy, and all of them combined, yeah. yeah. There were 750 million illiterate adults in the world, and two-thirds of those are women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Women are not in the U.S. Constitution. People are shocked by that. People think... Well, yeah, they are. It's the 14th Amendment. I'm like, mm, no, because the only protection we have in the Constitution is the in the U.S. Constitution is the right to vote, which is the 19th Amendment, yeah. which came well after the 14th Amendment. Why did women need the right to vote if they were protected in the 14th Amendment? 
Right. We are still fighting to have women in the U.S. Constitution. The ERA, which is my my tombstone issue, basically says um, that you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. S- uh, j- uh, Section two of that says it gives Congress the authority to legislate based on um, on that on Section one, and we. S- so of course, like. Why would why would why would men think that that women were of equal anything mm. if we're not in our founding documents? And by the way, it passed in 1972 the ERA, and then 38 states had to ratify. They gave us a, an arbitrary deadline to ratify 38 states. No other amendment has had an arbitrary deadline. They gave us 10 years. We were three states short. Since 1982, three states have um, have ratified. So the states are telling, telling the federal government that women should be involved in the Constitution and the stupid deadline, which no other, no other amendment has had, um, is in the way of women having equal humanity in the Constitution. Yeah, we have Phyllis Shafley to thank for that. Um, So we're gonna go into rapid fire questions. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. (laughs) Uh, So this is from V Percoco 13. What do you personally do to invite and engage the men in your life to start redefining or re-examining their masculinity? I just call them in. You know, they're there, and this won't be a long winded answer. I'll just tell you a story. When my husband uh, left the house, you know, to go on a business trip, he would say to my son, Take care of your mother. And I looked at my husband one day and I was like, This is telling him so many wrong things. He's like, What do you mean? I was like, Well, it's telling him that he, a little boy, needs to take care of his mother, but also that women need to be taken care of. No, I'm going to take care of him. Hmm. Love that. Um, what are you afraid of? Death. Not my own death. Death of the people I love. Oh, yeah. When was the last time you cried? Uh, just like 10 minutes ago in this interview. Hmm. When's the last time that you apologized? Um, probably yesterday for something. Uh, you have a time machine. And you get to go back to be with little Alyssa. I'm sure you've done some of this work yourself. What do you whisper in her ear? You are enough. Mm-hmm. And now you take the time machine to your funeral. Everyone's there, everyone you love. What do you hope that they say about you? That she was a good mother, wife, and did a lot of really great things with her life. Hmm. Final question. Mm. Um, I wonder, what do you think, because we normally ask what you think it means to be man enough. What do you think it just means to be enough? I think it's different for everyone. I think personal fulfillment is a big part of it. And I don't know that you can figure out what that is without struggle Mm, great but i do want to ask you also what you think it is to be man enough and the reason why i think it's an important question because we ask men all the time what we think it means to be man enough but i think we need to hear from women also what they think love it so what do you think it means to be man enough i think you know to to dismantle the oppression that has always been there in the way um in the way that you can, in the way that's right for you and the people around you. I think um, recognizing the history of uh, subjugation and doing everything you can to change the systems. I also think it's personal things like promoting women, um, mentoring women, uh, uh, not making women feel like we're in competition with one another. Um, 
you know, giving opportunity that was not always presented to us in a way um, where you you step back and you hand over the microphone. Hmm. So many, so many, so many people have um, are fighting a really hard fight, right? And so many people have continued this this cycle of oppression and being the oppressor and you know yes Liz we could talk about colonialism it is what we could talk about the enslaved we can talk about you know modern uh criminal justice system we can talk about all forms of systemic oppression it is being man enough is recognizing that you can do something about it and help other people to realize that they can do something about it too. Hmm. Well, you are certainly enough, Alyssa Milano. <laughs> That's Thank it. you. I think it's important. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah, yeah. And you can put this anywhere, but it's just, I feel like it's, I feel like it's an important thing when you're talking about when we were talking about sexual assault and um, and and rape and kids being hurt. Um, in the past, you know, rape was an offense against property. Hmm. And there were reparations that were paid to the ra to the rapist or whomever owned the women that they were raping and so when you know that and you see you know rape kits being backlogged or it being so difficult to actually prosecute um someone of a sexual crime or why women don't come forward, or all these things we are meant to 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 believe about the the sexual trauma that that men have inflicted on women. All of these laws even hmm. have stemmed from this one idea, this one idea that rape was an offense against property thank you thank you so much Alyssa. uh <sighs> thank you so much for being here for giving us your time uh i know it meant a lot to well, hey what did you he calls you face what did you call him jamie jazz you just jamie, jamie jazz, jazz yeah. all right well it, it, made, it meant a lot to jamie name. jazz i loved seeing him revert back to that 17 year old mm -hmm. boy today that was really sweet and uh he's my favorite and uh oh so good like, to talk to you he was always this self-reflective. I know he thinks that he he failed in, in, in parts of his life, but he was always this 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 shining light, this mm. this beautiful soul. Um, well, let me say something I, about I love so much. Oh, no, I love you. Just, just receive that. You don't have to say anything to me. Just receive that. Thank you. And bye. Thank you. <laughs> she just dropped the mic. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Man Enough. Welcome back to Man Enough. Mm. Jamie, that was your old friend. <laughs> yes, indeed. That was really sweet. You know, um, let me say a couple things. One is um, I've known Alyssa since, as we said, for very young. Um, this is someone behind closed doors in her life at 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, who always was doing the work, always cared about humanity, always cared about liberating people. She didn't always do it right. But every day I saw her, which is why I loved her so much, is she fucking cared about me more than most people did. She cared about women and would champion when she hear about someone that was hurt or in need, she would go into their defense. Now she's um, built a life. She's, she's not, th this is how I feel as a black man. Let me say this. And a lot of times we have guests on here. We have fucking brilliant guests. I feel incompetent compared to you all the time because you're a genius. You're super articulate. You speak without ums. 
you you are. He's, ta- he's talking to Liz. Ask her audience. I speak he's ta- with he's so, talking, so many words. He's talking I'm not to Liz, to. by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 you, you speak. You you speak um, also quickly, which is also a um um. I think something that we use against people like myself who needs to take pauses and breaks to get my thoughts together, but someone who can just boom, 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 boom. And people listen to that and they go, oh, this person, okay, that's acceptable. Then you listen to another black man who speaks and it's dismissed. And also maybe not as educated in this, so they don't have every fact, I don't have all the facts together, so then my passion and my care about it is uh, delegitimized. So I think what we do to women also Patriarchy is this. We pit women against each other. We have women that care about humanity. And then because they do it differently than another person, or because they, um, as Alyssa mentioned, you know, she messed up on something and then she apologized later for how she did it. And then it's this whole thing like, well, see, so so long as we can pit you guys against each other, now I don't have to deal with it. Rather than calling each other in, recognizing that, I think this is the issue with Christianity, for instance. There's hundreds of thousands of sects. It's not Christianity that's wrong. The Bible itself is wonderful and beautiful. But you have all these people with their own little interpretation of how they go about it, and then they pit against each other, and then we see destruction, we see chaos, rather than seeing that they just want, all of them want spiritual truth for everybody. But we get caught up in this other stuff that we get mixed up in. So what the reason why I'm sharing this is because I know that we all have different approaches and some we disagree with certain things. That's the process. That's we're learning in real time. Men, black men are taught to pit against each other. I mean, we hear about this crime about black against black, by the way, which is all this bullshit. Yeah. That's a whole yeah. other thing. But we see it and we point that out. And part of that is because we drink the Kool-Aid too, you know, um, and we start, um, questioning one another and then pitting against each other. And then now that becomes a distraction. So I don't want that to also be something. What I'd rather have audiences see is people who care about social justice, who dedicate their lives to it. Mm -hmm. And they may be learning in real time and may stumble. But if we focus on that rather than this is somebody, whoever it may be, um, and I don't say this in defense of Alyssa because I think she's doing the work she just does. So, but it made me just think about this that we that we don't focus on that like the rest of the world does so much, which is just more destruction. Hmm. We're just we're saying we care about something, and in the meantime, we're also then like pitting. So yeah, um, well, cancel culture also, as we've talked about, and I always credit Nitika Chopra, one of my best friends, who talks about you know we shouldn't be talking about cancel culture, we should be talking about pedestal culture. Like that's part of it, right? That certain people say the same thing that uh, you know a black woman has been saying for years, and everyone will pay attention to what that person is saying because we put those people, certain people, uh, based on a number of privileges that they have. Uh, on pedestals, right? And so if we got rid of pedestal culture, then we wouldn't, I think there wouldn't be as much of a, of a, of a drive to, 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 to cancel people who, who are like, hey, wait, why are you up there? Why are we all listening to you about this thing? Um, because yeah, we put people on pedestals. So I think it's, it's a reminder not to do that, you mm. know, whether someone is, uh, f- f- you know, someone doesn't have to be famous to be listened to, right? And we should right. be listening to more people and be listening actually to the people that we listen to the most, to the least, because they have the most to teach us about what it's actually yeah. like um, and what dismantling these structures um, looks like because they, are the ones who suffer the most Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. those structures remain. Yeah. Yeah. If you like what you're hearing, Mm. uh, you like this podcast, please like and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time. What's our show called? Man Enough. (laughs) (laughs) This is Man Enough. Man Enough.